Welcome to American Cannabis, <clears throat> hosted by our sponsor, Cannabis Tech. I'm your host, Ella Smith. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Today, we will be speaking with Dr. Alexei Peshkovsky from Industrial Sono Mechanics about nano emulsifications and ultrasonic extraction. Uh, Dr. Um, Peshkovsky, thank you for tuning in today. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Thanks for having me. So this is a, a very exciting topic. I don't know a whole lot about ultrasonic extraction and nano emulsification, so I'm excited to you know, explore this topic today with you and our audience. And so I want to give a little brief, brief background here on Alexi before we get started. Uh, Alexi is the co-founder and president of Industrial Sono, Me Sono Mechanics and really handles the direction and focus of where the company is going. He has a BA in chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania has a PhD in physical chemistry from Columbia University. He has 15 years of experience as a manager, investigator, and product developer in both academic and industrial sectors, mainly focusing on industrial instrumentation design and applica applications development. Um, and has written over 30 scientific papers, patents, presentations, as well as two books. So welcome. Thanks for, for tuning in today. Um, if you could... Alexi, please give us an overview of industrial sono mechanics and its core technology and main applications. Sure. Uh, industrial sono mechanics was organized about 12 years ago by my father, Sergei Pushkovsky, and myself to uh, commercialize the invention of what we call the barbell horn ultrasonic technology. This technology was uh, created by uh, my father, who was an ultrasound physicist, uh, essentially all his life in the Soviet Union. And we um, patented it um, and commercialized in 2004, with the company forming in 2006. What this technology does is it allows you to take a lab scale um, ultrasonic experiment which um, is conducted at a high ultrasonic amplitude. The amplitude is the displacement of the tip of the horn that relates directly to the intensity of ultrasound that is produced in the liquid. I'll play this video again. So uh, what we can do with uh, barbell horn ultrasonic technology is take that, increase the size of the horn, making it industrial, and retain the same high amplitude. This is essential for scaling up, and this is something that hasn't been possible uh, before this technology was introduced. Uh, with this, uh, one can simply take any lab scale experiment, of which there are many uh, published, uh, and uh, take it straight to the industrial scale. Uh, high amplitude produced by the horn in the liquid creates what's called acoustic cavitation. This is that white cloud you see under the tip of the horn and above the horn. This cloud is a very high shear field. It, um, it is composed of imploding vacuum bubbles that create microjets that uh, hit um, particles and break them up. So um, what this technology is particularly good for is making nanoparticles. Uh, we offer ultrasonic processors, uh, such as the one that was just displayed, uh, that uh, are used in a wide variety of um, applications, from pharmaceutical to biofuels to beverages, cosmetic. We worked with petroleum uh, companies for a while. Uh, so um, this is uh, uh, the, the set of industries that we service but we try to mainly focus on the pharmaceutical, uh, beverage, and cosmetic industries. Uh, what we offer are uh, these types of processors. This is a typical bench scale, so medium scale ultrasonic processor that we offer. And the way that it functions is uh, uh, outlined in the schematic where the liquid goes into this uh, storage tank on the right. It could be a large amount of liquid uh, for a large processor. It is pumped from the bottom of the tank into the reactor chamber, which is this part 
right in the middle, a flow cell, uh, with the barbell horn that's inserted into it, where uh, you create a very high uh, cavitation intensity. Uh, that's where the process occurs. Then it's pumped back into the tank and is recirculated continuously until the process is finished. The horn, the barbell horn, is driven by a transducer that's right above it. And transducer is driven by the ultrasonic generator, which conditions the electrical signal and gives us control over the process. How did you, how did you realize there's an opportunity for your technology to be used in the cannabis industry? Yeah, so our equipment is mainly designed for the pharmaceutical industry. And this is because it's particularly good at making um, nanoparticles. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry suffers from uh, an important issue, problem. They, uh, most of the time, need to deliver a hydrophobic or water-hating substance uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient to uh, a bloodstream, uh, the bloodstream being mostly water. So it's uh, problematic to deliver an oil-type material that doesn't dissolve in water into essentially water. Um, but they used to do this up to about 20, maybe 15 years ago, about 15 years ago. They used to do it by a process called microemulsification. Um, for that process, what you do is you supply an enormous amount of surfactants, which are basically types of soap, to the water, making it very loaded with these soapy molecules, which essentially solubilize oil-based substances into themselves. And in that way, kind of make them water compatible, water soluble, if you will. Uh, then they can be administered into the bloodstream by injection or in some other way, and they stay uh, dispersed through the bloodstream. And then they can travel with it and get delivered to the appropriate organs. The problem with this approach is that there is a tremendous amount of surface active materials, soaps. And this is not something you want in your bloodstream. Uh, but there was just no other way to do it. Then about 15 years ago, uh, the concept of nano emulsions came into play where instead of relying on the chemistry of the surfactants, uh, you instead apply mechanical shear. So instead of waiting for the, the surfactants chemically to break up the oil into tiny droplets, you simply break them up by physical force, which means in the end product, there's a lot less of any foreign chemicals. There still needs to be some uh, surfactant, uh, but First of all, they can be milder. The choice, the options for what surfactants you can use for that is incredibly broad, much, much broader than with microemulsions. So you can always choose very mild and uh, natural or, or biocompatible surfactants. And their amount is much lower. Uh, and this is essentially what our equipment is designed for, for making nanoemulsions in some cases where the active pharmaceutical ingredient doesn't dissolve in anything, and there are situations like that. It won't dissolve in any type of solvent or oil. Uh, in that case, uh, we uh, provide equipment to make nanocrystals. So you just take the, the material in the crystalline form and break them up into nanoparticles, deliver them that way. Uh, someone was asking if, if the tech, if it needs, if your technology requires surfactants or not, but with the way your, your system is set up, and that was a question that just came in. Yeah, yes, it does, uh, but a lot less than microemulsification. And uh, as I said, the choice of surfactants is much broader, so, so they can be much milder, very biocompatible, uh, generally regarded as safe, uh, even natural in many cases. But yes, there is some uh, amount that's always required. Uh, in general, to make nanoemulsions, the amount of surfactant will be less than the amount of oil that you're putting in even to make translucent nanoemulsions. We'll get to those in, in a few minutes. Uh, with microemulsions, you need five to 10 times more surfactant than the oil that you're emulsifying. So it's a, it's a big difference. And the choice is limited. I've got a handful that are coming and being flooded, so I'd like to see if we can get to some of these. So um, someone says here that, that, that 
they are working with one of your machines to emulsify cannabinoids. How can we encapsulate the finished liquid so it is stable in the capsule? So far, all attempts have melted the cap. I see. I think this question is better um, left for later because uh, some of sure. it will be answered during the talk. Okay, uh, but uh, I, I, I will I will address it. Sure. Um, so um, uh, coming back, uh, so most of the time our equipment was used for making nano emulsions. Uh, nano crystals is a, um, not as frequent for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but then about two years ago, the cannabis industry just exploded with the exact same need. Uh, there's a hydrophobic, water incompatible, oily substance, which is cannabis extract. It could be THC, CBD, whatever, CBD isolate. It's solid, but it's a type of oil anyway. It's just solid. Uh, it's an oil-soluble substance. So uh, the same need to deliver that substance to the water-based bloodstream. And it just happened that we're ready with the equipment. It was designed for this exact purpose. So if two years ago uh, we almost did nothing with the cannabis industry, uh, for the past two years, and especially for the past year, I would say it's about 80%, maybe more at this point, of what we do. Wow, so that's really, really become a major part of your business, it sounds like. Yeah, we got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 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 pretty exciting. Um, I have a question here from a, a, a gentleman. Um, do you recommend a dual phase systems like lecithin or a cellular cellular? I can pronounce it solubilizer. Uh, solubilizer uh, is uh, something that's used in the microemulsification process. It's a term where you use a surfactant. Uh, and a lot of it, and uh, make oils kind of soluble, solubilized in the water phase. Uh, I don't recommend doing that if making a nano emulsion is an option. And that's because the amount of surfactant, again, uh, would be much higher if you solubilize with it, and the choice is limited to very harsh ones. Now, um, what was the question? Phospholipids, lecithin? Uh, yes, exactly. Part of the question. Yeah, yeah. That's a, this, uh, lecithin is a good surfactant. It's, it's natural. It's very effective. Uh, the only issue with it is that um, lecithins used directly will most of the time form liposomes, not nano emulsions, and that's a different system. Liposomes are not meant to incorporate oils. They incorporate water-soluble substances in their core. They have an oily uh, dual layer, uh, sort of a bilayer of phospholipids, uh, for example, coming from lecithin, and then water also on the outside. Uh, you could incorporate some oil into their bilayer, into the skin of it, but the loading factor is much lower. So lecithin is great, uh, but uh, you just need to be careful about what type of phospholipids it contains, and it may need to be combined with a different surfactant. Uh, but uh, it, as, as part of the formulation, it's a, it's a good, it's a non-toxic, very effective surfactant. Okay. Here's another question. Um, how does the crystallization process work with, with this equipment? Uh, nano emulsification, you probably mean. Uh, how to make nano emulsions. Yes. Yeah. So uh, nano emulsions, and it's, it's good timing because we just talked about liposomes, so... Uh, the difference between liposomes and nano emulsions. I don't have a slide on uh, liposomes, but I can talk about the difference. And uh, this is a slide showing very roughly the schematic of nano emulsions. So how to make uh, nano emulsions or how to make uh, cannabinoids uh, water-soluble or water-compatible. I try not to use the word water-soluble because um, I'm trained as a chemist and so rigorously that wouldn't be correct. Uh, although it is very close to being correct for most intents and purposes. It, uh, nano emulsions, especially translucent nano emulsions, look like a solution. They behave very close to a solution. Uh, so perhaps water soluble is not entirely wrong, but it's, if you're going to be very rigorous, it's 
it's a colloidal suspension. It's not a solution. The solution would be when something breaks down to individual molecules. These are very small droplets, but still not individual molecules. So a nano emulsion looks like this. Uh, it has water as a continuous phase on the outside. It has oil, which is these yellow drops, uh, as a dispersed phase. And if you look at each droplet, it has this surfactant covering its surface. Now, surfactant is a type of agent that is hydrophobic on one end. Hydrophobic is water-hating or oil-loving, lipophilic sometimes it's also called. And that's represented by this little tail that's sticking into the yellow uh, interior of the droplet. So this part likes the oil, and it dissolves in oil. The other side, uh, the head of the, uh, the surfactant, uh, is this oval that uh, surrounds the entire surface of the droplet. So these are water-loving or hydrophilic, and they're in contact with the water. So the water, the droplet looks like a perfectly welcome entity. It has water-loving surface. To the oil, looking at the droplet from the inside, it looks like a perfectly oil-compatible substance uh, having these tails, uh, which are uh, oil-loving. So essentially, everybody's happy. And this emulsion is suspended in, uh, it, these droplets can be suspended in the water. And if they're correctly made with correct surfactants, these droplets will be small enough. And if they're made with the right equipment, with very high shear equipment, these droplets can be made very small and stable, meaning they will not combine uh, they will not coalesce. They will not float upwards or downwards. Uh, they will not cream. Uh, and that's because if they're small enough, uh, the Brownian motion that they undergo just naturally supersedes any kind of uh, systematic vertical uh, motion, any kind of separation. Uh, their buoyancy is very, very low when they're very small. So um, any desire to float is reduced. And the desire to bounce around by just Brownian motion is increased. So it's kind of like a self-stirring system. So these can be uh, completely uh, stable. Uh, in order to make that, um, what you need is an ultrasonic processor. Uh, this is our bench scale processor. A schematic of it, similar to the schematic I showed before. And you need a small amount of, well, you need some surfactant. Uh, this is a product that we offer. It's called Nano Stabilizer. Uh, the slide still says Stabilizer Package, but we changed the name. Now we call it Nano Stabilizer, and we've got a trademark on it, so we're trying to get used to the new way of saying it. So Nano Stabilizer, uh, it contains the entire formulation that is necessary to make uh, nano emulsions, specifically uh, carrier oils, uh, emulsifiers, antioxidant, uh, to protect uh, cannabinoids from oxidation, and uh, some basic preservatives to resist fungal, uh, fungus and bacteria. So once the nano emulsion is made, this is how it can be used. So this uh, video shows a 20 milligrams per milliliter CBD nano emulsion. It's translucent if you look at the, at the dropper bottle. It's not transparent, but once you dose it into the water, it disappears. Just give it a quick stir. And now it looks like a solution. So the bottle on the left has pure water. The bottle with 20 milligrams of CBD on the right has the dose in it. They are both equally transparent. Um, and this will be stable, uh, will not separate ever. The only thing that uh, one does need to worry about is light. Uh, light. And this has nothing to do with nano emulsions or anything like that. Light is just something that uh, degrades uh, most cannabinoids. So it's better if this bottle isn't transparent but of some dark material, UV resistant specifically. Ah, okay, so uh, we want to make sure that um, any type of holding container for it is not translucent so that we can ensure that the cannabinoids are not uh, degraded in any way possible. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. Yeah, it's better. So this is for demonstration purposes just to show. But many uh, products out there, 
um, have these clear bottles, CBD water with clear bottles. That's probably a mistake. Interesting. You see this, actually, I see it all over, and uh, it, it makes comp- no one's really paying attention. That's interesting. Um, that's probably, it's probably reasonable to mention what the benefits of, of these nanomulsions um, are if we, if we talked about how sure, to make them. Sure. Yeah. So, um, well, um, obviously, convenience is a huge benefit. It can just be added to water and dissolves in it, so you can infuse it into most beverages and administer them that way, just drink them. Uh, But uh, beyond convenience, probably the most important aspect is this. So this is a study done with a completely different um, substance. This is a pharmaceutical study. But uh, it does show the benefit of this type of delivery uh, method uh, of nanoemulsions versus uh, regular emulsions uh, for pretty much any type of active because the, the benefit belongs to the delivery vehicle more than, than to the substance itself. So if you look at this uh, graph, the bottom is um, a conventional emulsion, so a very rough, coarse emulsion of an active substance. And you can see that the bioavailability is pretty low. Vertical is the plasma concentration of whatever this active is. Uh, now, once you make a submicron emulsion, so we're talking several hundreds of nanometer size nanoemulsion, the bioavailability goes up. And once you go to a nanoemulsion, uh, this particular one, I think, had something like 170 nanometer uh, droplet size, uh, which is not by, by any means the smallest you can go, but it does show that you get this shift to earlier onset of action and the bioavailability, the plasma concentration, increases. Now, this trend uh, is expected to continue if you keep making the droplets smaller. Uh, we are currently participating in the study on that. Uh, We don't have any results yet, but uh, I hope to have them soon. Uh, This is what happens uh, to nanoemulsions as you make the droplets smaller. So on the left is a nanoemulsion um, similar to the one that already showed benefits uh, in the previous slide. Uh, But on this slide, this is the biggest droplet. Uh, So it's milky and white. That's what nanoemulsions look like until droplets, um, until their droplets become smaller than 100 nanometers in diameter. So you can see that as it goes right, as it gets smaller, and this is the same exact concentration of oil, which is deliberately under-processed and then processed a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. So when you get to 31 nanometers, it becomes close to transparent. Uh, nanoemulsions made with our nanostabilizer, that jar I showed before, and our equipment uh, can get down to um, this situation. This is uh, a CBD natural uh, full spectrum extract nanoemulsion, and you can see that the, the mean droplet size is about 18, I think it was, or it's it's below 20 nanometers. So this is very uh, highly translucent, completely transparent uh, when added to a uh, bulk of water, um, and is uh, very effective. I could mention a little bit about why translucency is important uh, beyond convenience. Convenience. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so uh, first of all, again, uh, you can just add it to a beverage and it and it disappears. So that's that's very convenient. But um, perhaps more importantly is this. Uh, this trend is expected to continue. And so our translucency is just a side effect of uh, making smaller droplets. And making smaller droplets is good because the onset of action is expected to become shorter and the bioavailability is expected to um, to increase. In what ways can this water-soluble cannabis extracts be administered? I think now we can get to that question. Sure, yeah. So the easiest is just to drink it. Um, I would say 
um, if 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 that's an option, then uh, just making a beverage, um, and it could be pretty much any water-based beverage um, uh, that 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 you would like it to be, including hot beverages, coffee, tea, whatever, or cold iced coffee too, iced tea. So uh, it, um, the easiest is to drink it. Uh, this is the kind of natural and intended by nature way of breaking nutrients into your body. But it could also be a sublingual tincture. Uh, in that way, it will probably act faster. Not probably, it will definitely act faster. The issue with that is it's difficult to prescribe a dose because everybody swallows differently and everybody salivates differently. So you think it's under your tongue, but really it's being washed down and becoming more of a digestive absorption. So um, it's hard if the bioavailability of oral, uh, of digestive absorption is low and sublingual is high, such as the case with some alcohol-based tinctures. That could be a problem because you don't know how much you swallowed and you change the bioavailability for that portion. Therefore, you don't really know the dose in the end. Uh, with manner emulsions, it's not as big of an issue because the bioavailability is high in both cases. So just because you shifted absorption from under your tongue to your small intestine, the difference is smaller. So it's still prescribable. Uh, it could be made into a nasal spray. That's very fast. Uh, very quick way into the bloodstream, except, uh, again, some of it will go through and, and get swallowed. Uh, it could even be nebulized to the lungs. You can't vape nanoemulsions. You can't vape anything water-based. Um, but uh, you could nebulize them to the lungs. One thing to do there is to make sure that surfactants, um, any surfactants that you used, are compatible with the lung surfactant. Otherwise, uh, there could be some irritation. Uh, and they could be made into topicals and creams um, or pretty much anything that had a uh, water base to it. Also edibles. For example, when you make a brownie, there is water participating in the, in the process, so you could dilute the nano emulsion into that and then use it, and uh, the brownie uh, will be baked. Most of the water will evaporate, but probably not all of it. And so once it's swallowed, most of the nanomulsion can be reconstituted in your gastric fluids and uh, act similarly to, to a beverage. Could this uh, technology allow for um, intravenous use, IVs, and this type of stuff to enter the, enter the bloodstream quicker and faster? Uh, sure. Yeah, as long as the surfactants are biocompatible uh, with the bloodstream, which really they should be, uh, intravenous injection would be the quickest and the most complete. By definition, it would be 100% uh, uh, bioavailable and would be very quick. And this is exactly what the pharma uh, companies always try to do. It's not always the most convenient way for the patient. Um, I would prefer to drink it than to be injected with it. But for medical situations, sure. for emergencies, uh, sure, yes. It could be fed as an IV. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, why is there an increase in the bioavailability and why does it act faster? Yeah, so this is a central question uh, to nano emulsions. It deserves some attention. Um, if you swallow uh, a capsule with, with oil or consume an edible that had oil, let's say butter, with the cannabis and the, and the brownie that was made, was made with that butter. Or in some other way, delivered oil in bulk, not as an emulsion, not as a nano emulsion, into your stomach. Uh, from your stomach, it will be emptied into your uh, small intestine, and there it needs to be absorbed into, uh, into the uh, intestinal walls through the absorptive cells. Now, in order to get to the absorption site, the oil needs to cross what's called unstirred aqueous layer. And in order to do that, it needs to be made water compatible in some way. So the body's natural way of doing it is if you look at these large oil droplets uh, on the upper left, uh, this is 
let's say, the oil that was consumed in the capsule. Uh, they cannot uh, get to the absorption site. And even if they could, they wouldn't be absorbed. They're too large. Uh, what your body does to it, it tries to digest it. So if there are any triglycerides, uh, vegetable oils, which there should be for pretty much any formulation, uh, this is the function of carrier oil, they will get digested, and your body will release uh, free fatty acids from them. Um, now, these free fatty acids, in conjunction with bile salts are produced by the gallbladder and some naturally present phospholipids, will take any non-digestible oils, such as uh, cannabis oils that were contained in the formulation, uh, oils that cannot make free fatty acids because they're not triglycerides. And it will try to um, kind of break them off from the bulk chemically, very similarly to how it's done in the microemulsion situation, uh, and encapsulate them, sort of cover them by, uh, by, the, by um, their um, hydrophobic tails. So these are naturally present surfactants, including free fatty acids that you just made from triglycerides. These are surfactant acting molecules, and they will try to make small droplets of the active material, oil, and make what's called mixed micelles. So you can see that uh, first you make this coarse emulsion from the, from the large drops, and then from that you make what's called mixed micelles. And the, the process is very slow. It's, um, it's a chemically driven process. The only shear is just some basic vibration and, and peristaltics of, of the small intestine. So very slowly, mixed micelles are made. Then they can cross the unstirred aqueous layer, get to the surface of, um, of the absorptive cells, get into the cells, and then they can go in two directions. They can go into the lymph, and that happens if uh, chylomicrons are present in the cells, which happens if you ate a fatty meal prior to the administration. And if you didn't eat a fatty meal, then... Uh, they will actually not, uh, not be absorbed at all, mostly, because you won't have triglycerides to make free fatty acids, to make mixed micelles. But if you somehow did uh, have, maybe you didn't eat a lot, but you had enough to make some mixed micelles, uh, but not enough to make chylomicrons in the cells, then um, they will be directed after absorption into the bloodstream and to the liver. So the issue with this is making mixed micelles is a very slow process, and anybody who ever consumed an edible with THC knows how it feels. In the beginning, there's nothing. For about an hour, there's nothing. An hour and a half, maybe something. At two hours, it's coming in. Uh, and then it's going to keep coming in uh, for another couple hours. And it, it, the maximum is at four. And that's because some... Uh, my cells already got into your bloodstream. Others are still being made. And so it's not a steady state. It's not a flat uh, sort of profile, which is pretty inconvenient. Uh, it's constantly changing. It's hard to kind of park yourself at a certain level. So for medical administration, this is a serious problem because everything will depend on triglycerides, how much you ate prior to that, how much you ate during that what your uh, digestion is like. Everybody's different. And also, it's a competition between natural elimination of whatever you ate through your intestine and out, and absorption. So the bioavailability is very low and unpredictable. So it's, it's hard to really prescribe a dose, and the doses are very high. They have to be high so that you can get at least something in. Now, the reason that nanoemulsions are... Uh, so much quicker acting and um, more bioavailable and on top of that are flat in their prof profile is because this distribution, I showed the distribution a little bit earlier. This is actually a distribution for nanoemulsions uh, droplets that um, are made with, uh, with our equipment and uh, nano stabilizer. So when the substance arrives, in the small intestine, 
it's in the form of something very similar to these mixed micelles. You don't have to make them. They are prepared to um, travel through the stirred aqueous layer right away and get absorbed. And now, if you have chylomicrons, it will go into the lymph. If you don't, it will go into the bloodstream. But it will all more or less go in together. So it's not like you're building the concentration very slowly, going up and up and up for a long time. They will do this faster and uh, much more completely so the dose can be prescribed and the absorption is much more independent of uh, your environment, whatever else you ate and things like that. Okay. Um, Alexi, before we move on to the next topic of extraction, I've got quite a bit of questions here. There's no way I'm going to be able to hit all of them, so I'm going to just select a few here that we can try to hit on answer some of these questions for our audience, if that's okay with you. Sure. First question is, what is generally the amplitude of the barbell horns? What is the lifetime of them? Um, we uh, recommend operating at about 90 microns peak to peak. They can go well above 100. Uh, our large systems go up to, I think, 115 microns. But normally that's a bit too much. Uh, manner emulsions are formed pretty well at between 80 and about 90, 95 microns on a peak to peak. Okay. Here's another question. What is the size of the particles in your emulsions and how was this measured? DLS? or cry Tim. Yeah, so this is convenient. For the, this is a slide that I have open right now. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. About, about 20, uh, 20 to 40 on nanometers is normally where you end up, depending on your raw materials. And this is uh, when it's made with our nano stabilizer. Uh, obviously, uh, if you use your own formulation, then uh, it could be uh, something else. Uh, it depends on what you're using. Uh, and this particular graph was DLS, dynamic light scattering. Uh, static light scattering or laser diffraction is another good method, although it gets a little flaky when you go below 100 nanometers. Well, I shouldn't say a little flaky. It's just not, um, it's not the best technique for very small droplets. Dynamic light scattering is appropriate for below 100 nanometers, so this is how this was measured. Okay. Let's see if I can pull out a few more here for us that... Uh... Um, here's the one that's saying they're currently using polysorbate 80 in their emulsions and with one of your machines, and it's working great. I just one good one to use. Uh, polysorbate 80 is a good uh, surfactant, but it's a bit harsh. Uh, it's grass, generally regarded as safe. Uh, you, can, um, you can have it in your formulations, and they would be food grade, but it's bitter. And um, it's very synthetic. So if, if you're okay with that, um, then uh, it, it's, a, it's a good surface. It's, as far as making small droplets, it's very effective, yes. Okay. Um, let's do one more here, and we will move on to our extraction. Um, how is this technology to do a void mask off? flavors or bit or bitters for that matter um, uh, I, I I heard about half, half of the question how is this technology uh, able uh, to mask flavors I think the question was yeah either uh, avoid or mask off flavors I see okay yeah that's a that's a very good question very common question uh, okay. this technology is not able to remove flavors that are already there so uh, the nano stabilizer that we offer is tasteless. Uh, you could even paste it directly, although that would be a huge dose compared to what it would normally be uh, as part of nano emulsion. But even then, it, it won't be bitter or it, it practically won't have any taste. Uh, the the sonication uh, also doesn't create any taste. However, if your starting material has a taste, it, this taste will be enhanced, uh, because everything is enhanced. It's the bioavailability question. The bioavailability is increased because droplets are small. 
the bioavailability of whatever has the taste will also be increased. So if your starting extract is bitter, the nanomalsion will be bitter. If your starting uh, material is an isolate and you put it on your tongue and you don't taste anything, that doesn't mean it doesn't have any taste. That just means it's not bioavailable to your taste buds. It doesn't dissolve in water. Uh, so when you nanoemulsify it, there may be some bitterness to it, uh, depending on how clean your starting material is. For very clean distillates and very clean um, isolates, uh, there's practically no taste. We have a few customers that manage to have very low taste, but it's difficult to get your starting material that clean. Uh, there is a way to mask it by introducing competing flavors, uh, but this is not something that we are specialists in, and uh, there are plenty of um, uh, food scientists that can help you with that, but uh, we don't include uh, any masking agents in our formulations in order to give people the, the ability to essentially choose what they want to do with it. Okay. Let's move on to extraction and really discuss, um, you know, what is the physical principle of ultrasonic extraction and what is it? This is very new to me. I have, uh, you know, I'm very, very curious to learn more about this. Sure. So um, to talk about extraction, we first have to talk about cavitation a little bit more in depth. So this is, again, the cavitation uh, cloud, and it consists of these small vacuum bubbles that are formed, grow, and at some point turn around and collapse. They have nothing inside a uh, vacuum, so they implode into nothing. Uh, but they do so asymmetrically if there is any kind of disturbance in the liquid. So if you have an oil droplet, or if you have a cell, a plant cell, or anything, the implosion will not happen symmetrically. One wall will pierce the other wall of the droplet. And that will create what's called a microjet. Microjets are very potent, very small scale, very fast. So uh, for extraction, for nanomulsification, uh, they simply hit a droplet of oil and break it up in, in smaller droplets. Now for extraction, a similar thing happens. It can hit a cell and break it open. And the cell can then release its contents. So ultrasonic extraction is a fairly common process and it's used uh, for solvent extraction of all different kinds of things uh, in the food industry and other industries as well. Um, but um, in the case of cannabis extraction, uh, there are two things that are becoming somewhat popular. One is uh, cryogenic ethanol extraction. So ethanol, when it's warm, is able to extract very quickly and efficiently, but that co-extracts unwanted uh, things. It co-extracts some waxes and chlorophyll, and then everything needs to be winterized. So a new thing is to extract with cryogenic ethanol, which is essentially already at um, winterization conditions, and so it leaves the waxes and chlorophyll behind. It's a good solvent for extraction. But it's slower. Uh, when it's cold, it's not as aggressive. So um, we have some people using our systems to extract with uh, cold ethanol, reporting uh, good results, preliminary results. Um, another thing you could do easily is uh, an equivalent of bubble hash, basically uh, break off the trichomes. So it's not exactly extraction, but it's, uh, could be, it could be a step in the um, starting step in the extraction process. Uh, trichomes can, can be break, broken off uh, mechanically, but with ultrasound, it's more efficient. So ice water and the flower material break off uh, trichomes and then filter and collect them. Um, but uh, all of it is essentially um, taken forward by ultrasonic cavitation, which is basically mechanical shear, very high mechanical shear. What potential advantage does this offer compared to other extraction methods? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, it accelerates the extraction process by introducing very high shear, but that's not always necessary. There are many solvents that 
extract quickly. Uh, there are some extraction systems that are very good. Um, they work very well. But um, so accelerating the existing extraction is a minor advantage. But there is one potential advantage that is not minor, that is potentially very, uh, very important. And we're working on it right now. This is now that we have the manual emulsification process all pretty much figured out and offered off the shelf, we're now uh, directing most of our efforts to uh, this novel extraction method. And that's just by using water. So water is obviously not a, a good solvent for cannabis, uh, for cannabinoids, because they don't dissolve in water. So it, it, it can't be used as a solvent instead of ethanol or, or hydrocarbon, for example, or CO2. But as I demonstrated before, we are able to make cannabinoids believe that water is a good environment for them. So nanoemulsions, they're not rigorously speaking solutions, but they behave like solutions. So by similar principle, uh, we seem to be able to, and this is preliminary data, and uh, the data is looking very good, we're able to extract the cannabis oils into water with some amount of surfactant. And then the, the thing that we have to really work out is once you have the emulsion, how do you get cannabinoids out? So we have an inverse problem. The nanoemulsions that are made are very stable. They're very high quality nanoemulsions and, and it's very difficult to break them. Uh, it's possible to break them by extensive centrifugation, but that's impractical. So what we're working on now is how to essentially separate the oil from the water in separate layers, which would happen if we didn't have such a stable nanoemulsion. Once that works out, uh, hopefully the oil will just flow to the top, and then we'll be able to drain the water and collect the oil. This will be a very advantageous method because you would not need any harsh solvents. There's nothing flammable. Uh, there's some surfactant, but it could be very biocompatible. So potentially, if this works out, um, I believe this would be a, a, a significant improvement for the industry. Is there a pH that that water would need to be at when you do this process? Um, it's unclear right now. Uh, to extract, uh, it doesn't really matter for the surfactants that we're using. We try to stay with non-ionic surfactants for now. So pH doesn't really uh, affect the process. On the other hand, we're just starting. So uh, we'll explore everything, including pH. So, this is, you know, you mentioned early on that about 80% of your business now is in the cannabis space. That's pretty exciting. You know, what current products do you offer to the cannabis sector, and, you know, where can we see it being used? Sure. So, um, at this point, it's basically very simple. We offer ultrasonic processors. This is a schematic of our medium-scale bench scale ultrasonic processor, or we call it the BSP-1200. Uh, we have a smaller processor for um, roughly slightly bigger than lab scale. We don't offer really small lab scale processors. Those are available from pretty much uh, any ultrasonic company. But uh, we offer everything that's scaled up from there. So um, our smaller processor is the LSP-500, and that's uh, good for uh, maybe a liter uh, of matter emulsion at a time, uh, broken up into uh, 200 milliliter uh, batches, or it could be used in the flow mode like this, and then you can process about a liter, but it's not a production system. It's a R&D system. Uh, this BSP-1200 system is a production system. You can make anywhere from five to 10 liters of matter emulsion per hour. And just to give you a sense of perspective, 10 liters at 20 milligrams per milliliter is 20,000 doses that could be made per hour. Uh, the concentration doesn't have to stop there. It's still translucent and very effective up to about 50 uh, milligrams per milliliter. So 10 liters can become 50,000 doses. Uh, it's the, I would say it's the upper productivity limit for the system. 
And then we have a larger system, the ISP3000, which is about four to five times larger and faster than the BSP. And uh, in conjunction with it, we offer the nano stabilizer. Uh, again, this slide still says uh, stabilizer package, but we now call it the nano stabilizer. Uh, and this is the entire formulation that's uh, required for nano emulsification. Or you could uh, develop your own formulation, and uh, then uh, just the ultrasonic system will be all you need from us. Uh, for the extraction, we don't offer an off-the-shelf solution yet. For the water extraction, we're working on it. But when we are finished with it, we're hoping to be able to offer the same type of uh, combination. It would be an ultrasonic system and some substance that helps you extract into water. And perhaps if post-processing is necessary, then we'll offer whatever's needed for that. So as far as the off-the-shelf solution for nano emulsification, uh, it's a system and nano stabilizer, and for extraction, just the system at this point. In order to run your, your technology, do, do you need to be a chemist to use your products at all, or can someone like myself who does not have a, a science background be able to be trained on your standard operating procedures and use your technology? Sure. This is a common question, and I have a perfect slide for that. It speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> you do not have to be <laughs> you don't have to be a crazy scientist to nano emulsify with our um, with our technology. Uh, we provide everything that you need for the formulation and for the, the shear equipment, and it comes with instructions. They're as simple as a simple recipe. Uh, basically, take this, put it in here, stir, add to the to the main tank, recirculate, turn on ultrasound watch for translucency when translucency is what it's supposed to be, stop, filter, and collect. As simple as that. So you do not have to be a scientist. You just need some very basic lab space and some basic common sense. Uh, if you develop your own formulations or use your own formulations, then uh, you need to be probably um, a chemist or a similar type of um, uh, uh, scientist to uh, to be able to develop formulations. It doesn't have to be necessarily a chemist. Someone uh, could could uh, just learn how to develop formulations to some extent, but uh, more scientific background is then required. The same for extractions at this point until we figure out an off-the-shelf solution that will come with instructions. Okay, that's great. And so. You know, what states are you working in? Where can, where, where can the products be, be seen? And are you, are you going to be at any upcoming trade shows? How can the public reach out to you? Sure. Uh, so um, as far as um, uh, what states we're working in, uh, the company is located in New York, and we're opening another facility in uh, Florida, in Miami, probably within the next year. Uh, we don't work with cannabis or uh, make nano emulsions ourselves, so we don't have any issues with state borders or or, uh, or country borders. Our equipment is sold all over the world. The nano stabilizer is also all just uh, food grade uh, materials that can be shipped anywhere, so there are absolutely no limitations. And we do present at um, trade shows. We recently came back from the World Medical Conference in Pittsburgh. A few weeks ago, uh, we are going to be at um, Cannabis World Congress at the Javits Center in New York on May 30th, going to June 2nd. Uh, I will be giving a lecture at uh, Marijuana for Medical Professionals um, conference in Denver. Um, I think it's in October, mid-October this year. Beyond that, I'm not sure yet, but we probably will be on the West Coast somewhere later in the year. Um, and you're saying we could hope to see some new technology coming out soon from you guys, which is even even more exciting. Um, anything else you want to touch on today here? We've got a few more minutes we're going to wrap up. Um, I've, I've got literally a, a handful of questions if you want to go through them. They're, they're, they're touching on different parts of the of, of, of your of your talk today. Uh, so if you if you want to take a few minutes to go back and kind of maybe answer a few more of these questions, let me know and we can kind of uh, extend this today to go over if you're okay with that. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to, and I think we left one question for later. Uh, I guess now is later, <laughs> but I forgot what the question was. 
Oh Lord, if I can go back and find that. Um, here's a question that um, I've had pop up a few a few times. You know, please please discuss liposomes versus nano emulsions if you could. Sure, uh, liposomes are uh, generally meant to encapsulate water soluble uh, materials. Uh, they have an aqueous or water-based interior, not oil-based interior. They have a lipid bilayer skin and water on the outside. So water is both on the inside and the, and the outside of these. So if you wanted to encapsulate and deliver, let's say, vi vitamin C, you could put it in water, make liposomes encapsulate that vitamin C inside the liposome, and then deliver it that way, and that would control the release of vitamin C. It would slow it down. So it's in solution, but uh, that solution is uh, inside um, a controlled particle. Uh, you could incorporate some oil-based substance into the bilayer, into the skin of a liposome, but the loading factor would be lower. Uh, there's just a lot more space inside the liposome than in the thin bilayer. And nanoemulsions have oil on the inside and, and water on the outside. So if what you're trying to do is deliver an oil-based substance, it's best to put it in a nanoemulsion, uh, thereby occupying the interior, and um, deliver them that way. Okay, perfect. Here's another question on nanoemulsifications. What are the frequencies used for nanoemulsifications? Uh, we, uh, our equipment works at 20 kilohertz, 20,000 hertz. Uh, the lower the frequency, the um, easier it is to make large-scale equipment. Uh, there are uh, many uh, reasons, mathematical reasons for that. But long story short, we try to operate at as low a frequency as possible, uh, but it has to stay above human hearing. So 20 kilohertz is about the upper edge of human hearing, and that's where we operate. You know, is your method better than spray drying? I'm not sure if that's relevant or not. Uh, spray drying is not a method of making that emulsions. It's a completely different uh, thing. Spray drying is used in post-processing sometimes with our nano emulsions. Uh, it's a way of making dry powders. So uh, if someone wanted to make a dry powder, they could take a nano emulsion, uh, put an encapsulating matrix into it. It would be some sort of a sugar-like substance, whatever works best. Sometimes multidextrin is used, although I'm not sure that's the right material for nano emulsions. Uh, but some sort of a water-soluble uh, um, matrix, and then that can be spray dried, uh, thereby replacing the water with the, let's say, sugar. So sugar takes the place of water, and now you have an oil droplet encapsulated in solid sugar versus water. Once that is put back into water, sugar dissolves out and reconstitutes the nano emulsion back to where it was. Uh, this is something that can happen in a beverage or in the gastric juice if you uh, consume uh, that powder directly. Uh, but spray drying is more of a following step than, uh, rather than an alternative. I think I found the question here that we left um, for the end here, and it's how to place nano emulsion inside a capsule without melting the cap. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> nano emulsions are mostly water, and capsules are meant to dissolve in your gastric juices and your gastric fluids. So they dissolve in water. Uh, if you have water on the inside, it will dissolve the capsule from the inside. There are some special capsules that um, work for certain pH. So uh, nano emulsions don't really have to have any specific type of pH. They could be neutral, let's say pH 7, and if the capsule doesn't dissolve at that pH, uh, but does dissolve at pH 3, then uh, nano emulsion won't dissolve from the inside, but once it's swallowed and hits the, the gastric fluids with low pH, it will release the nano emulsion. So that could be one way. Great answer. Can you give examples of good antioxidants to use? Um, sure. Vitamin E is a good antioxidant. Vitamin C, although vitamin C is water-soluble, so that could just be in 
the bulk. Vitamin D is oil soluble, so that could be an oil phase. Um, those are the ones that um, I normally prefer, but there are many um, out there, many very biocompatible ones, and they all roughly work about the same way. Okay. Alex, I think we're going to wrap this up. There's no way I can sift through all these questions. There's just um, a lot of them that I think we touched on quite a bit of the answers for them. And so um, I appreciate you getting on today. Is there anything you'd like to add to kind of wrap this up today, if I may have missed anything specific? Um, well, no, I appreciate um, the opportunity to present this. This is new technology. We're very excited about it. We're working to improve it. We're especially excited uh, the possibility of making water-based extraction possible. And I will be happy to um, update anyone on this. Uh, we can be contacted um, through our website. It's sonamechanics.com to contact us with any questions. Th thanks very much for the opportunity. I want to thank our audience for tuning in today for this Great talk, um, Dr. Alexei Peshkovsky with Industrial Sonar Mechanics with Nano Emulsification and Ultrasonic Extraction. I'm Ella Smith, your host. Thank you for tuning in to the American Cannabis, and I'd like to thank our host, Cannabis Tech. Until next month, have a great day. Appreciate your time.